So hello there and welcome to a brand new episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast, a show where we take all of the latest news, gossip and events in the world of Formula One and we relay that back to you for your listening and viewing pleasure, depending on which platform you choose to follow us on. And of course, this is the review of the Portuguese Grand Prix in Portimao. A very, very good race, perhaps not as many climactic highlights as we got in Imola and Bahrain, but definitely a Grand Prix with plenty of talking points. One, of course, by Sir Lewis Hamilton, picking up his 97th Grand Prix win of his career to extend his championship lead over Max Verstappen now to eight points. And of course, joining me on this episode, the DNF1 F1 podcast, my co-host, Mr. Courtney Pine. As always, Courtney, first of all, how are you doing this Sunday afternoon? Are you okay? Hello, everyone. Yeah, I've had a good day. I've had a good week and um, a fairly decent race has capped off a good week for me. Absolutely. And a very decent race if you are Mercedes. Of course, not a one-two finish. Once again, Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton taking the top two places. But as it was in Bahrain, Lewis Hamilton having the edge over Max Verstappen. But of course, let's get into the big talking points, Courtney. The start of the race, Valtteri Bottas managed to nail it on pole position. And as we expected, Valtteri did put up some level of resistance, but over the course of the race, you could feel that Valtteri, how long was it going to be before it caved in? And unfortunately for him, eventually it did. But before we get into the uh, ins and outs of his race in particular, what did you make of Sir Lewis Hamilton's performance today as a whole? Were you impressed by the champion or did you feel that this was a routine victory for the seven-time world champion? I was certainly impressed by it. Um, we really are seeing a guy that's enjoying this champion, uh, this championship challenge for Max Verstappen. It seems to have taken Lewis almost to the next level, which I don't think was possible. But after all these years of watching and supporting this guy, I was still truly impressed by those overtakes he made on Verstappen and Bottas because they were risky, but they were necessary for him to win the race. And it seems that yet again, He seems to find in moments that are giving Lewis the edge over Verstappen in his championship. Absolutely. And and it proved that around the outside at turn one proved to be a good overtaking place, not just for Lewis Hamilton, but of course, Max Verstappen pulling that move on Lewis, which we will talk about in just a moment. Uh, A few other guys also making moves in there as well. Esteban Ocon found some joy there. So did Fernando Alonso in the race. And of course, Carlos Sainz uh, uh, very early on in the race managed to find some joy around the outside of turn one but going into the big talking points in the race of course we had that early safety car caused by Kimi Raikkonen running into the back of his teammate Antonio Giovinazzi very very embarrassing moment for Kimi Raikkonen um was there much that you could make of that incident Corny or perhaps was it just Raikkonen not being aware of where his teammate was yeah I found I found it a bit bizarre because it was it seemed that Kimi had so much space on the left to you know, overtake Jim and Atsy, but for some reason he decided to still be a right. It, it seems like Kimi Raikkonen still hadn't quite woken up for the race, but at least it made the uh, beginning of the race a bit more interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, it was a very lively start, but of course it was probably one of the moments where Kimi thought he was just going to breeze past his teammate. The gap would be there and he's probably checking something on his steering wheel or just making an adjustment. Not to realise he's driving into the back of him got half of his front wing stuck under his car. And fortunately, Kimi Raikkonen was wise and experienced enough to know that his race was pretty much wrecked. So rather than try to carry on, just went straight off into turn one over the gravel and just parked the car up because that could have been a potentially nasty accident for someone behind if he tried to keep going, especially at the speed that he was going. So well done to Kimi on that part, but very much a mistake for Kimi. And, you know, it's got to be said that Giovinazzi obviously flew the flag for Alfa Romeo today. Didn't get a point, but obviously an impressive performance from him. Do you feel that perhaps Giovinazzi's performances are starting to warm up the Alfa Romeo team, who are probably looking at their lineup for 2022, which could include Callum Eilat, who got an FP run at one run this weekend, his first in Formula One. Do you feel that Giovinazzi's performances are starting to give Alfa Romeo a reason to keep him on next season, perhaps assuming that Kimi Raikkonen may retire at the end of the season? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, all he can do is worry about his own performances. And if he carries on 
performing like this, he certainly has a chance. But I still believe that his chances depend on whether Kimi Raikkonen leaves. If, mm. if Kimi Raikkonen stays, I think there's going to be drivers, like you've already said, like Ilot and maybe Mick Schumacher, that will be quite attractive prospects for the team. But as I said, all he can do is worry about what he's doing. And today's a good start for him. Yeah, absolutely. And um, as I said, no points for him today, obviously finishing down in 12th position, but not a bad result, all things considered, especially considering this circuit is a lot more power sensitive than perhaps some people were giving it credit for, um, which obviously would not suit the Alfa Romeos at all with the Ferrari engine, but they did a good job with Giovinazzi today. So I think they'll be relatively happy with that performance in particular. But of course, as the race went on, we had the safety car and this kind of brought about the first big incident of the race at the front where Valtteri Bottas and I was watching at the time and I was saying, I was, I was watching it with my brother and I was saying to him, Bottas has got to do what Verstappen did at Imola, back the pack up for as long as possible so that he can floor it at the last possible moment over the line because it's such a long We'll say along straight, obviously you've got turn 14 and 15, which is basically flat out. So the last thing Bottas wants to do is to give Lewis behind him or Max Verstappen a big run at him going into turn one because it'd be a sitting duck. Bottas didn't do that. He followed what Max did for his example in Imola, left as late as possible, left Hamilton for dead. And that allowed Max Verstappen to get alongside him. who got a great run on Lewis to overtake him brilliantly into turn one. And of course, critically round the outside. And this time, Max was able to keep it on the road rather than in Bahrain. Um, what did you think of that move in particular, Courtney? Because um, at the time, it was very impressive, given that this was the first of many overtakes in that position from Verstappen. But uh, nonetheless, a very impressive overtake at the time. Well, yeah, it was important for him to do it. I mean... Overall, it did seem that Mercedes did have an edge performance-wise over Red Bull today. But Max knows he has to be taking any opportunity against Lewis if he's to win this championship. And at that point, I'm sure he's pretty chuffed with what he's done. Mm, absolutely. But of course, as the race progressed a few laps later, he was stuck behind Bottas, trying to find a way to make the same move of Valtteri Bottas. And it just seemed that... For everything that Max could do, there were a few parts of the track where Mercedes were able to use their advantage to stretch out enough of the gap. Turn eight being one of them, where Mercedes were a lot more aggressive in that area, made up a lot of time in qualifying. It certainly showed that way in the race. And of course, down the straight all the way from turn 14 to turn one, that Mercedes engine, despite many people, including myself, feeling that Honda perhaps have got very close to being on level terms with them. It still seems that Mercedes do have a power advantage, a significant one at that, over the rest of the field, which proved to be probably what kept Bottas ahead of Max. But as the race went on, we got to lap 10. Max Verstappen looked like he was going to make that opportunity to overtake Valtteri Bottas, but then made a critical error going slightly wide, losing the rear end a little bit at turn 14, which gave Lewis Hamilton the one and only opportunity that he needed to get in Max's DRS and make a very similar overtake on Max Verstappen going into turn one. Um, I mean, what did you make of that move, Courtney? Because even though it was very similar to what Max did, it was as every bit as impressive, maybe more under the circumstances. Well, yeah, I think there was a little bit more risk involved with um, Lewis's move. Again, particularly in the championship that is so close if Max had tagged Lewis, because usually if two drivers collide, it's usually the driver that's in front that will be worse off because you tend to spin. So Lewis was, the, the risk was more against Lewis in, on this occasion, but the move was ballsy. But he knows, he, they both know that they need to be making these moves. And it's also when it comes down to mind games. Because these drivers, don't get me wrong, these drivers clearly have a respect for each other. And it's actually quite, it's quite refreshing to see where there's actual genuine respect. We saw it with Lewis and Vettel as well. But these moments make a big difference in the championship run when they come up against each other again because in future future races, it's just happen to be thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got, to be, I've got to be careful. I can't really plant the car there because Lewis can pull it there. So these these moments like this do give Lewis a little bit of advantage mentally. So, yeah, in that, in that moment, things are looking great for Lewis. I mean, would it be fair to say that the one big difference that I'm noticing between Max Verstappen and Lewis Hamilton in particular, if we strip everything else away and assume that they're on equal terms, which they're probably as close to as they've ever been in their careers. But the one difference I'm noticing is that where Max Verstappen 
is trying to find any and every opportunity he can manifest to make an overtake in this race in particular on Bottas, I think it's fair to say this was a great example. Max tried to overtake here. He tried to overtake a turn one. He tries to overtake a turn eight. He tries to overtake a turn 10. Mm. He's trying to find any and every opportunity that comes his way rather than chip away at the gap as much as he can to sort of get as close as possible to making that overtake into turn one. Whereas Lewis knows exactly where he wants to pass people. He's not trying to force a move here or try and take the spot earlier, perhaps if it presents itself to him with a half chance. He's sizing it up to the point where when he gets to turn one, he knows he's going to make that move. That, to me, proved to be a big, big difference between the two today. And you could probably look back at it and say, Max could be in a bit overzealous trying to make the move earlier than he needs to, probably cause those odd little mistakes. And they're very, very minuscule but they're obvious enough to be a difference between winning the race like Lewis did and obviously coming second like Max did. Do you feel that that could prove to be something over the course of the season where if Max doesn't win this championship, he'll very much look back on as a missed opportunity and perhaps where he come up short? Oh, of course. The, the thing is, you can be as talented as, as you like. And clearly Max is like, as a fan, I love that. I love he, I love to watch him race. I love his ability. He's a good addition to the sport. But again, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you're in a championship battle, it just it takes that level of experience, a level of calm. And and Lewis has that. You know, you've got to remember this. This is a guy that's on the top of his game. He's statistically the best driver of all time. And all that experience and confidence coming together, it makes a big difference. In these kind of moments, you know, I was listening to um, in the build up to a race like Nico Rosberg of all people. He seemed to be. Um, I think there was a, there are some people with Nico and Max included that are really starting to see how special Lewis really is. Mm. And Nico Rosberg did. To be fair, he said it seems that Max is making these slight mistakes that you're not seeing from Lewis. Apart from that that moment in the wet in Imola. With Max, you are seeing, so you've got to remember, Max Verstappen should have been on pole. But mm. He made an error, which led to the lap time being deleted. So if, he, if that lap time had been deleted, that could have changed the, the complexion of this, of this race. So if Max carries on making these little errors the way he is, you're going, you're going to see an accumulation of points in Lewis's favour, and he's going to find it harder to come back, particularly with the way Mercedes are going. Because it does seem that still Mercedes are finding gains race by race. So Max needs to be capitalising any opportunity he gets. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm glad you brought up Nico Rosberg, because as a fan of the sport that does love the technical side of it, I've got to say, I love having Nico Rosberg on coverage for Sky F1 when you're watching it. You know, his analysis, his punditry, the detail that he goes into I can't get enough of it I love watching and hearing what Nico Rosberg has to say when he talks about Formula One it's it's a shame we don't get him on more often um, I'd love to have him on the show but of course maybe one day we might be lucky enough and big enough to attract someone like Nico to get his analysis and take on the current Formula One world but that aside um, you're absolutely right Courtney this is something that Red Bull have to be particularly aware of as well as Max Verstappen because Mercedes do seem to be able to find newer things about their car or unlock, the, unlock these nuances, I suppose, that are hidden very much in the depths of the car design and it's very hard to extract. But over time, they do tend to have this knack for finding more and more performance from their car, which, of course, Red Bull fans will certainly not want to hear if this trend continues I would say in their defence today that this was probably a track that Mercedes were expecting to be very strong at. Despite the games Red Bull have made, it's clear that the characteristics were going to suit Mercedes a bit more over the race than Red Bull, although qualifying, the gap seems to be a bit shorter. Um, and it did seem that Max really had to push very, very hard today in order to get that second place. So I don't think he'll be too disappointed. But as you said, not getting that fastest up at the end proved to be a bit of a pain. But of course, we'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, but but then, of course, we had the big moment in the race where Lewis Hamilton managed to make that move on his teammate Valtteri Bottas. Very, very similar to what we saw last season at Portimao, where Bottas looked to be relatively strong, out in clear air, controlling the race relatively well. But then towards the end of that first stint, he started to fall back. And again, quite dramatically, it's almost as if his performance caved 
And Lewis was like, right, I've got you. And this was even more surprising because Lewis spent a lot of the early parts of that first stint behind Max Verstappen and his teammate. So for Lewis to be able to keep hold of those tyres for as long as he did and still have that extra performance on Bottas was quite impressive to the point where the overtake on Bottas was actually rather straightforward, wouldn't you say? Ironically, given all the things we've heard about Lewis Hamilton during Mercedes' dominance, I really do believe it's going to take a car deficit before a, a car performance deficit to stop Lewis from winning this championship. Because it just seems on the cars are fairly equal. Obviously, Bottas has the same car and Verstappen has a similar car in terms of performance. Lewis seems so relaxed. Maybe maybe it's not that way inside the cockpit, but from watching, he just seems to be calm, relaxed, and he seems to strike at the ideal moment. And again, it, it, it comes with experience. You know, the guy's exceptionally experienced. He's experienced everything you need to really deal with in this bowl. Hmm. And it's made him, he's making, it's, it's made him the, the full package. So at this point, I think Red Bull are going to have to get a performance gain on Mercedes for Max to beat Lewis. Quite possibly. Um, as I said, there are different characteristics from circuit to circuit. We're going to Catalonia next, which might be a circuit Red Bull may fancy their chances a lot more than Mercedes do. As I said, it's going to be swings and roundabouts throughout the season. I think what's key for Red Bull, who did bring some upgrades to this circuit in the hope to try and um, increase the margin over Mercedes. I think Dr. Helmut Marco believed that that car overall was better than Mercedes and it stretched an advantage that it had. Um, but we didn't see that today. And probably either the characteristics of the track suited Mercedes better or perhaps they just didn't do a good enough job with the package they had. Um, judging by the performance um, of Perez today, it may have been the former, mm. but it's not good for Red Bull if they felt convinced they could get a win today and to only come out second best. And to be fair, probably could have been a lot bigger, the overall margin than it was. Obviously, we had the pit stop for Max, but it was about five seconds or so. But Lewis looked like he was well in control of that race once he got out in front. Another thing worth bearing in mind is that Mercedes haven't actually bought any massive upgrades. They've been unlocking the package that they have. Now, I don't know if it's going to be the same this year, given the work going into 2022. Usually you see some teams bring in big upgrades to Barcelona. So if Mercedes do that and they bring a big upgrade, that could be ominous for Red Bull fans. Absolutely. I mean, Mercedes, everybody kind of brings like small, tiny, minor updates mm. to every circuit. There are some teams that tend to bring bigger upgrade packages around this time of the season in Barcelona, as you mentioned. Um, again, I'm not sure what Red Bull are going to do at Catalonia. It could be they did part today and then bring some more next week. But this development war is going to be key. And Mercedes, as you said, haven't really brought anything massive. The only thing they've probably done is bring a few little updates that have made it easier for them to handle having a low rate concept in um, a, an era of regulations, which may not necessarily benefit from that particular philosophy. So it's something Red Bull needs to be aware of, but I'm pretty sure that given the result that they got today, I don't think they'll be massively disappointed, although they will need to make sure they take their chances in future races where the car probably would be better than Mercedes. As I said, it's going to be a lot of changes from race to race this season as today looked like it was a Mercedes track, a Mercedes advantage. When you consider the overall package, not by much, but Mercedes, as I said, they won the race that the, perhaps they should have done. Red Bull have got to do the same. So it'll be interesting to see what happens in Spain. Um, so Lewis pretty much controlled the race to the end, got the race win. Great performance from Lewis Hamilton once again, extending his lead in the championship to eight points. Max Verstappen, of course, did get in front of Bottas. They had to undercut Bottas in the pit stops. And of course, that proved to be critical because Valtteri Bottas's pit stop was a second slower than Max's. And that gave a Max enough time with much warmer hard tyres to make the overtake on Bottas, who had nothing he could defend with. And that proved to be the end of it. But on the final lap, of course, there was a flurry of pit stops. We had Perez pitting his one stop for Red Bull, getting the fastest lap. Then Bartas, just before the end, did the same thing for Mercedes. And then Red Bull took a big risk with Max Verstappen, making that pit stop onto the soft tyres. He did get the fastest lap. However, because he exceeded track limits on turn 14, that time was deleted. And therefore, Bottas ended up with the fastest lap, to which Max Verstappen was surprised because he thought that 
they weren't monitoring track limits to turn 14, uh, which he said in the post-race press conference. I should clarify to all you guys who are probably wondering, oh, well, it's one rule for Max or one rule for Lewis in this because uh, of what happened in Bahrain and one rule for everyone else. I'm going to stress to you now, Regarding track limits, they were monitoring track limits at turn 14. Michael Massey released the race notes last night and he said that they were, and the drivers knew this. So Max was wrong in what he said. Uh, it just completely missed that information. So to clarify, that lap should have been deleted because he did exceed track limits there. So hopefully that's all we've got to worry about with track limits to Courtney on this discussion. Just wanted to make that relevant because these points for fastest lap are proven to be very vital this year. Mm-hmm. And if Max had got it, he'd have been seven points behind Lewis. So practically a win away on paper, but it's now still eight. So Lewis still has, if you like a second place in his pocket over Max Verstappen. And how crucial could this championship be? Could it be won by such a small margin that fastest lap could prove to be the definitive factor? Well, the fans are certainly be open that's the case, you know, because obviously with 23 races, can you imagine if we get to race 23 and there's still a championship, that would be, uh, that'd be incredible for the fans. But you're right, these, these extra, these extra points for, you know, as fast as that, they could make a difference. And again, it's come, it's coming down to all these, these small moments. So we look back on Max's performance, generally speaking, great as always, but the deleted lap and qualifying, and then the missed out extra point for, um, Track limits. They are two moments to come back to bite them at the end of this championship. So it goes back to that original point. He really needs to... What's the best way of describing this? He just really needs to polish off what already is a great racecraft in order to win this championship. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And as Rosberg said, he needs to be perfect against Lewis because mm. that's what is going to be required to beat Lewis Hamilton, as we've seen. Um, it can be done. Rosberg did it, but perfection is required in this case and so far in defense of Max Verstappen as brilliant as he has been he's not been perfect and there's still more there I mean you rightly pointed out in qualifying his Q1 his Q3 time his first run would have been enough for pole position if Mm -hmm. it stayed within the track limits and you probably feel that he probably could have stayed within track limits and still got pole position so it's moments like that that can decide a championship and I think Max is very quickly finding out that as good as he is, he has to raise his game and be perfect to beat Lewis Hamilton because Lewis is not going to let him have it. Probably more a daunting task than any other driver we've seen in this in the history of Formula One to beat in a world championship like this. So good luck to him. And he's certainly going to have a good go at it. Um, but let's talk briefly about Valtteri Bottas now. Um, a very good Saturday, you know, Valtteri, as he did last season in Portimao, was very, very good. Of course, this time he did get on pole position. But um, again, similar to last season, Courtney, looked strong at the start, managed the race rather well, managed his ties, or so it seemed, to be pretty good. But then towards the latter uh, latter stages of that first stint, his ties fell away and Lewis pretty much got him. And then after that, Max Verstappen got him as well, to the point where he was comfortably third fastest albeit with the fastest lap um a better day for Bottas but once again still looks to be some way off the leading two contenders in this championship do you feel that that's something that Valtteri Bottas will be concerned about given that this looks like it's the same old story with him and do you feel that his performance today is still not going to be enough to convince Mercedes to keep him on for next season. Cause I think we've got to talk about this now because this season he may, this may be his last chance. The way this championship is going could actually ironically turn out to be to the benefit of Valtteri because whether he likes it or not, same with Sergio Perez, these guys could turn out to be pivotal with the backup role that they play for Lewis and Max. And I know we'll probably go on to Sergio a little bit later on, a bit later on, but they seem to be getting the hang of their cars respectively, slowly but surely. And it seemed that, like today, Bottas was a, was was involved in this race for the first time this season. He was in a race to some capacity, and then Perez was almost in a race in terms of putting pressure on Mercedes. If they carry on on the trajectory that they're going, they will influence this championship. And if Valtteri continues on this on his trajectory and he makes a difference in holding, taking enough points off Max to win this championship, Mercedes could well reward him for his efforts by giving him another year. Maybe. Um, of course, 
We have heard rumours this weekend, particularly comments from what Lewis has said and Toto, that Lewis could still be staying on at Mercedes for Mm -hmm. not just next season, but perhaps a few years after that. So that'll be music to the ears of Lewis Hamilton fans and Mercedes fans in particular, I'm sure would want to keep Lewis on for as long as possible. So it does seem that Mercedes are looking now to see who will partner as Lewis Hamilton. And they have a strong number two in Valtteri Bottas, but there is still that temptation that perhaps it might be better for them in a new set of regulations to promote George Russell. We'll have to wait and see. But again, a weekend for Valtteri where Saturday looks so good, although according to some people with showing some clips in the Mercedes garage, they didn't obviously agree. Um, But that being said, I'm sure Netflix will pick up on that one if they were filming it, but we'll have to wait and see with Drive to Survive season four when that eventually comes out. But once again, Sunday proved to be the same old story where not only Lewis gets the better of him, but Max Verstappen as well in the Red Bull, arguably perhaps in a car that was weaker than theirs today. So, you know, it's not good, but Valtteri probably did the minimum that was expected, I suppose. Um, But whether that's good enough, I'll have to wait and see. Um, Sergio Perez, you you briefly mentioned him, Courtney. Perez, a bit of a mixed bag today because the qualifying, he looked like all weekend he had, he was about half a second off the pace of the top three. He did look like he was not comfortable on a track that's low grip, Um, fluctuating conditions, particularly with the wind so close to the coast in the Algarves. Of course, it's a difficult track to get right. But having said that and having a difficult start, Perez did manage to recover, get himself back into the top four. And true to Sergio Perez's nature, looked after the tyres relatively well to the point where he could have proven to be a a caveat in the Hamilton Verstappen equation, ultimately wasn't successful. But um, what do you make of his drive today, Courtney? Do you feel Perez did good or do you feel that he just delivered what was expected of him today? It's certainly an improvement from the uh, to the beginning of the season. I think deep down he might feel encouraged by it. But Red Bull need him to have better starts, you know, because he seems to be getting caught up in minor incidents that sort of hold him back. And then he's playing catch up for the rest of the race. But what will encourage Red Bull is that He's, he, he showed his main weapon in his arsenal in this race, and that is tyre preservation. Because I remember in pre-season, me, you and Lee discussed this, and that is actually the point where Perez has an advantage, even over Verstappen. Looking after his tyres is his main talent. So if he gains his confidence and he's able to preserve his tyres the way he did today, that's going to be a strategic advantage for Red Bull going into upcoming races. So I think they'll, I think Red Bull overall will be encouraged by the weekend they had, but maybe they'll be looking at Perez's side with more encouragement, even more than, more so than Max. Absolutely. I mean, Perez had a difficult start. He got overtaken by Carlos Sainz in the Ferrari into turn one. And then at the restart, he was jumped by Lando Norris. And eventually he had to race hard to get those places back, which he did. And then, as you mentioned, bringing out his ace in the sleeve there, the longevity, the time management that he's very, very good at. And it brought him back into play. Of course, he was uh, best trying to take the fastest lap, which ultimately was unsuccessful. But, um, you, you know, this is something that Gasly and Albon really struggled with as well. But unlike those two, Perez seems to be able to just recover from that and at the very least, deliver the minimum that's expected of him. And I think for Red Bull, that's enough for now. I'm sure they're hoping that once he gets up to speed, and even Perez himself still believes the car is driving him rather than the other way around, which isn't a surprise to hear at this point in his time at Red Bull. It's still early days. But they're going to hope that Perez can, at very least, get in that battle with the two Mercedes guys and prove to be a reliable rear gunner to Verstappen because today it was very much a two Mercedes versus one Red Bull, a complete contrast to what we saw in Imola at the early stages of that race with Hamilton up against the two Red Bulls. So they will certainly want Perez to be in that fight more often, but it did seem like he was off the pace this weekend. So perhaps fourth was not too bad for him and Mm. Red Bull will just live to fight another day, but no good stuff in the end from Sergio Perez, one driver of the day, voted by the fans. I had heard a rumour that Nikita Mazepin was actually the driver of the day. Uh, Apparently there were some social forums on Instagram and Twitter that I had actually come across 
that were trying to galvanize people to vote for Mazepina's drive for the day. I'm not sure if this is in response to the social media blackout regarding online abuse as a big F you to all of this. I'm not going to accuse anyone of anything or put words in people's mouths. I'm just speculating here. So do not take what I just said to heart on this regard. I'm probably way wider the mark. But if that was true, and I mean, they didn't show the graphic of because they usually towards the end of the race they usually show the they graphic do. of who's right. leaving the poll so oh, part God. of me feels like perhaps Mazepin was winning that and in light of what's been going on you know whether you are how you feel about that incident in particular we're not going to go into that but that would have made for awkward viewing either way to see his name driver of the day although of course if Mazepin does put in a performance worthy of driver of the day then he should be rewarded for it but that wasn't to be. We don't know. Again, I'm speculating here. And Perez was awarded driver of the day. And I feel like, I don't know if he was driver of the day. Personally, I would have probably picked Lewis or Orlando. Lando Norris. One of them two. Um, or even Mick Schumacher. But of course, we'll yeah, get into Mick's well. race. Yeah, we'll get into Mick a little bit later on. But as I said, I'm speculating here, guys. So make of it what you like. I hope you're um, wrong. I hope you're wrong. I do. T- I do too. I really, really do. I, as I said, I'm not convinced on this. I just, I saw stuff on social media about Mazepin trying to get people to vote him dry for the day. And the only conclusion I can think as to why they would do that is to be, you know, because of what's been going on with the social media blackout, whether or not you're for it or against it or what your thoughts on that. Um, as I said, point made, we'll move on. Um, and aptly to Lando Norris, once again, I've got to say, I am so glad. I'm really, really glad that Lando Norris is proving me and I'm sure other people wrong in the massive improvement in his racecraft and maturity and the whole package. I mean, yes, of course, I've already said this was very much a power sensitive circuit. So I'm sure McLaren would have fancied their chances at a good result today. But once again, Lando Norris proving to be the cherry on top of that cherry bake world today getting fifth place beating ferrari beating Charles Leclerc once again for the third time this season i don't think i can sum up courtney or add any more superlatives to how brilliant lando has been he's my driver of the season so far mm-hmm. when all things considered and once again we didn't see much of him other than that overtake on perez earlier in the race after the safety car but I tell you what, what a performance from Lando Norris again, especially as well when he pitted onto the medium tires. I think it was lap 29. So he would have took those mediums about 35, 36 laps, which is very, very long distance. And uh, he never looked like he was under threat in that second half of the race. He really, you're right. I'm going to second what you said. He's taken a real step forward. He, he done well last season, generally speaking, but he's taken another step um, forward in that regard. Maybe Carlos Sainz not being in the same team as him maybe he's helped him mature to an extent. But I don't, I'm not going to discredit his actual performance. That's, that's just a, a fault maybe to dwell over. But he really has taken that step forward. And I said this so many times, for somebody that's followed him since his F2 days, I'm really pleased to see this happen because in terms of ability, he showed it from a young age. He's so much smaller than just the meme lord. Yes, the jokes are great. But he really is a good driver. And in my opinion, he is the best of the rest this season. The way we saw Max Verstappen, mm. Max Verstappen was the best of the rest last season. I'd say at this point, yep, yeah, we're only three races in. But certainly at this point, Lando Norris is the best of the rest. And if, if he carries on the way he's going, he will be a championship contender in the future. And I can't wait for that to happen. Well, he's third in the Drivers' Championship at the moment. Of course, probably a bit out of place. I imagine as the season goes on, we'll see Perez and Bottas. Of course, Bottas yeah. getting some big points today to overhaul him eventually. But, um, you know, the way he's driving at the moment, as I said, is so much more maturity to his driving. His race craft has improved massively. You know, his qualifying performance was never questionable. We knew he was very good over one lap. I think our concern was is that in some races on Sunday, he would either be there or thereabouts, or he'd just not necessarily go missing, but there's nothing spectacular. There's nothing to say, oh, wow, look at this kid. He's got it, you know. But this season, he is showing at every time, no matter what adversity he's thrown his way. And of course, Imla, he was very fortunate um, against Charles Leclerc to, you know, for that red flag, because I think Charles Leclerc would feel 
that he could have got second in that race. But Lando is taking risks. He's taking advantage of these situations and they're paying off and he's managing the car, managing the tires so, so well, like he did today. You've got to say he's really delivering for McLaren and they must be so, so thrilled with his progress. I am absolutely delighted for him. I, I don't like to be proven wrong because I'm quite stubborn. Anyone that knows me will know I'm very stubborn <laughs> and opinionated on certain things, but I am so, so immensely proud that Lando and Norris has proven me wrong and is proving a lot of people wrong this season and long may that continue. Yeah, I agree. You know what? A couple of seasons ago, when we were spoken about the post Lewis Hamilton era, we always thought, okay, Max Verstappen's going to be the main guy, but Charles Leclerc and George Russell aren't going to be too far behind. I'm going to make a bold statement. I mentioned it just a couple of minutes ago. I made a slight reference to it. I'm going to put Lando Norris in that mix once Lewis retires. He carries on the way he's going. I really do think he has the overall package to challenge his drivers over the course of a season. Mm. that's a good shout and I feel like because he's still so young you know he's only 21 people still look at him as like a baby in Formula One and retrospect he is I mean of course it's a much younger crop of drivers than we're probably used to but he's still so much to him and I think people are starting to take notice of him I'm certainly taking more notice of him of course I've followed him for a long time but I've never really seen this um, cutting edge you know part of him this um, you know, as I said, maturity, uh, there's so much going on there, all good things. And of course, it's still early days, but it's a really good and a really good sign of things to come for Lando Norris. And I really hope that continues. Um, just a quick question before we move on from Lando, Courtney. McLaren obviously could prove to be the be all and end all for Lando in terms of his career. Given the progress McLaren are making, there's perhaps no reason right now for Lando to consider his options elsewhere. Do you feel that McLaren will be the be-all and end-all for him and could be where his career will be? Or do you feel that he may have to look elsewhere over the next three or four years if his stock continues to rise at the rate that it is and McLaren don't quite rise to meet it? It really does depend where they go after these um, the, the 22, 2022 regulation changes. Um, you're right, if he carries on on this trajectory, the likes of Mercedes, Red Bull, or maybe possibly Ferrari might be looking at him in the future. I, I think with McLaren, British-based team, he's been there from, you know, from since he was a kid. That is his home. And maybe that brings out, maybe maybe that's what's bringing out this level of performance um, out for him. But if McLaren starts to sort of go downhill again, again, this is only hypothetically speaking, the big teams are going to be looking at looking at this guy because he really is starting to become an impressive driver. Hmm, absolutely. I mean, we're getting similar hallmarks to what happened with Lewis, of course. So he started his career at McLaren. It was a different time than, of course, Lewis, very impressive driver. It exceeded so many expectations to being a world champion in his first two seasons, nearly in the first one. Uh, and McLaren were championship contenders then. It was hard to see if Lewis was going to leave McLaren, where he would go and to what end would he need to go? But of course, Things changed. Mercedes gave him an opportunity. He took the risk. And of course, it paid off massively to the point where he's the most successful Formula One driver of all time so many years later. Um, it's hard to see if that sort of thing can happen for Lando at this point. But as I said, you know, 2022, big mix up. McLaren may absolutely nail it. They've certainly nailed it so far. So I have to watch this space. But right now, Lando looking very, very good in that McLaren. To his teammate, Daniel Ricciardo, who had a bad qualifying session on on Saturday. He didn't get out of Q1, big shock for him. But I would say he recovered pretty well in the race. Still not quite at the ultimate performance that he would like. There's still plenty more to come. But I think he'd have, if you'd have offered him ninth place from 16th, I think he would have took that today. Yeah, it seems that the teams, uh, the drivers that have changed teams with this slight regulation change have been struggling to get into the pace of it. So we look at Perez, you look at Vettel, and I think we're seeing the same with Daniel Ricciardo. He hasn't become an average driver out of nowhere. He, he does have the ability to turn it around. And as we've seen with Perez, maybe this could be the start of the recovery for Daniel Ricciardo. I, I expect him in the coming races to be a lot closer to Lando. Mm, I absolutely hope so. And it's probably that Lando is performing so well that perhaps it's made Ricciardo's performances look worse than they mm. actually are. 
I mean, we've got to remember that, you know, Lando's raised his game. Ricardo obviously needs to rise to meet it. But there's definitely a much higher ceiling there at the moment than what we're seeing at the moment with Ricardo. So hopefully that will improve. But I think given the way qualifying went, I think he'd have been relatively happy. And of course, as we will get into, I think McLaren will look at the bigger picture and think, actually, this was a good day for us. Um, which brings us to Ferrari, who there are positives, but I think today probably a big the first big mistake from them for one of their drivers and um, we'll talk about Charles Leclerc qualified eighth probably wasn't overly happy because qualifying is usually better than that but Paul Simao it's very very difficult you can take one lap to really get it right and equally one lap where it doesn't go so well Ferrari probably weren't expecting to be very very good here at Paul Simao they had a good race last season all things considered, and all the chaos, they just kept their heads clear, their noses clean, and just managed to deliver a good result today. Um, this season, the race was relatively tepid in terms of action compared to what we saw last season. And as a result, Ferrari probably struggled on a track that was going to suit the power uh, hungry cars of like McLaren and other cars in particular. But I would say Charles Leclerc, sixth place, perhaps not a bad result. All things considered, I think he delivered as only to be beat by Lando in the McLaren. I think, you know, that's not exactly too bad for him, wouldn't you say? It seemed that the Ferraris were struggling on the mediums. That seemed to be the compound they were struggling on the most. Overall, I think both the drivers should be satisfied with their performance. I think that where they finished was where Ferrari are. Whether the fans like it or not, that is the level that they're at at the moment. We'll see what comes. I think next season is so... is gargantuan for Ferrari they have to get next year right because the Ferrari fans are, it, there's been a shift uh, it seems the Ferrari fans have become a lot more patient of understanding the situation if they don't turn it around next season <laughs> there's going to be mayhem within that fan base but going back to the point they are they the drivers extracted the best from the car overall they should be happy with it and I don't really expect Ferrari to be developing much this season. So I expect to see the drivers finishing where they did stay for most of the season. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit biased here because I'm a Ferrari fan, but I kind of look at the car without the engine as a package. This, you know, for example, and I see that car overall looking like the third best car on the grid. If you take the car and not the engine in particular. And I think that some tracks we're going to see Ferrari had that advantage. They certainly did it in Milan, unfortunately circumstances prevented them from being able to take advantage of that, although they did get a good result. Today, once again, Lando Norris, brilliant, um, but it was a difficult track for Ferrari to really get the most. As you said, Courtney, they very much chew up their tyres more than probably anybody else. And this is something that Ferrari will need to eradicate from their car in future seasons because they've always been good on their tyres in the last three or four years, excluding last season. But this season and last season, they very much struggled on their tyres. And that's probably what, affected their strategy today Charles looked all right on the harder tires but as the race went on it's it was clear that he just didn't have the pace to beat Lando today um moving on to Carlos Sainz very impressive qualifying from Carlos Sainz he does love this track he loves being at circuits that are low grip and inconsistent you do send, tend to see the best out of Carlos Sainz at circuits like this unfortunately today though despite a very very strong start I think you could probably say that the team let him down today on strategy. Um, they pit him early to try and get the undercut on Lando Norris, which looked like it might work, but it didn't because Lando was able to cover that off. But unfortunately, they put him on the medium tyres. And whilst Lando was on the medium tyres, who did an excellent job to manage them, it was clear that Sainz was not going to be able to do the same in that Ferrari. Clearly, the Ferrari looks like it loads a lot more on its tyres and leads on its tyres more than the other cars, which might explain why it's improved in terms of its overall grip, but at the result of higher tyre deck, which has affected his race strategy. Would you feel that today Ferrari, Sainz will feel that despite putting in arguably he's one of his better performances across the weekend for Ferrari, that they let him down on strategy today and probably should have put him on the hard tyres like they did with Leclerc. Yeah, it's, it's a missed opportunity for a driver that's just joined a team and he wants to make, you know, he wants to make an impact. But at the end of the day, it was down to a strategic error. So he shouldn't beat himself up too much over it. And if anything, he should give him confidence going into future races. 
Mm, absolutely. Of course, Ferrari did have to switch cars. They uh, point. There was a point in the race where they asked the, the signs to move over the Cl Leclerc. Made perfect sense at the time, but that was really forced by the fact that they put him on the wrong tyres. If they'd have put him on the harder tyres, he may have come sixth today or seventh or may have challenged Lando for fifth. We'll never know. But Ferrari threw away some big points today, which will be music to the McLaren fans' ears because, of course, not only did Ricardo catch and overtake Carlos Sainz for ninth place, starting so far back, which really rubbed salt in the wounds, but Sainz didn't even finish in the points today. Pierre Gasly and Fernando Alonso both got him as well, which resulted in a P11 for Carlos Sainz. So very disappointing today. But I don't think Carlos Sainz can feel that he did much wrong. I think that one was the team own, own going themselves. Um, we just mentioned Alpine briefly. Let's talk about them. Now, got to say, Courtney, I don't know if this is a one-off because of the Portimao track being quite unorthodox compared to some of the other circuits, but Alpine have found some performance all of a sudden. I mean, we thought... Out of nowhere. Yeah, that we <laughs> thought they were going to be yeah. in the mix, but... They looked like they were straggling with Aston Martin, perhaps, but out of nowhere, they brought some updates to this car and it has made a huge difference to the point where Esteban Ocon and Fernando Alonso finished in seventh and eighth, respectively, today. Esteban Ocon and Alonso, it's quite interesting how their races kind of went because Alonso in qualifying didn't get into Q3. Ocon got into sixth on the grid, so he did a great job. But Ocon fell away at the early part of the race, but then both of them on the hard tyres in the second stint, both very much coming into their own and were so, so quick that they managed to get well into the top 10 today. So I think Alpine must be pretty, pretty pleased with how today went, Courtney. The likes of Ferrari and Alfa Tauri would have been looking at today going, shit, like we, we could be in for another challenge here. You know, it's it's impressive, and it's uh, it's good to it's good to see Fernando Alonso drive in an F1 car again because it's been a long time. Of course, he wants to be at the front, um, but a good day for Fernando, but also a good day for Rockon. It seems that maybe, just maybe, he's getting the levels of performances that he's going to need to keep that seat. Mm. I mean, Ocon looked a bit better in Imola. Certainly mm. looked a lot better today. And this is exactly the sort of performance that Ocon needs to put in in order to convince Alpine to keep him on next season. We know Alonso is going to be there if he chooses to stay another year. So Ocon needs to make sure that with the ever-growing threat of other drivers that might want that seat next year, one we've mentioned already, Pierre Gasly, several times, it's good for Ocon to deliver a good performance because we know he's capable. Uh, and today was a very good day for him. I think he'd be delighted even though he lost a place from his starting position, I think he'd be very delighted with that performance, particularly in the second half of the race. The Alpines really switched on the harder tyres. Fernando Alonso also, you know, he, he it's funny with Fernando Alonso because since he's come back to Formula One, he's had a few moments already where he's um, made everyone take notice of his return to say the Fernando would fold. But he's been very quiet, very incognito-like in these races. Today, however, in the second half of this race, where it looked like it might go the same way, he very much came alive to the point where Ricardo was chasing signs down to try and overtake him for it was um, eighth place at the time. But Alonso ended up catching Ricardo and overtook him and then, of course, overtook signs. So it looks like Fernando showing some signs of getting his mojo back. Would you feel that... You know, this is something he needs to continue doing this season, or do you feel that Fernando looks like he's finding his feet again? Yeah, I've been mean, this season. I think the plan for Alpine and Fernando Alonso in particular is to have a solid season in 2021 and then hopefully find a loophole in regulations to be in championship contention for next season. So, both the team and the driver this weekend is a good start for them to build those foundations. and. A happy Fernando is a quick Fernando. So I think the team, yeah, the, the team, well, the team in general, they should be happy with both their drivers. So Alpine will probably be one of the happiest teams to leave in the circuit. Mm, absolutely. Um, let's briefly touch on Alpha Tauri as well. Gasly getting into the top 10, of course, passing signs just before the end of the race. So they got a point. Sonoda down in 15th overall. Very quiet it, race. Yeah, very quiet race for Yuki Sonoda. Obviously scored points. Um, in his debut race. So, but since then, despite preseason testing and Bahrain suggesting that Alpha Tauri have a car that can battle McLaren and Ferrari for third place, it seems that that perhaps was a bit of a false dawn after all, because since then, 
they've really struggled in that midfield battle to get into the upper echelons of it. And now that Alpine have made a huge step forward by the looks of it, of course, we'll have to wait and see if that is confirmed in other races. But would it be fair to say perhaps AlphaTauri have missed their best opportunity already to pick up some big points this season? Or do you feel that perhaps as the season goes on, we may start to see AlphaTauri raise their game in the way that some of the other teams already have? They missed a big opportunity in Bahrain. They seemed quick in Bahrain. And the incident with Gasly at the start, I think that was a big loss for them. And as we already know, Adam, we're not going to be seeing massive developments this season, given what's coming next year. So I, I think I think Alpha Tauri, they, they've got to make a decision. Do we do we put extra attention on this season and risk sacrifice the next season to an extent? I doubt they will. I, I think that I think most of these teams in around the the midfield or towards the bottom of the midfield will probably quit development early, given where they are. So I don't really expect Alpha Tauri to be making big strides the way that we've seen with Alpine. It, I mean, it's so hard to say because I think we all agreed at a time that in this midfield battle, if we had an outstanding leader in this midfield battle, which you know we've got McLaren and Ferrari, the clear mm. two teams that lead in this fight. Alpine have certainly thrown their hat in today to join this battle if they keep that level of performance up. But um, Alpha Tauri, a team with much less resources than the other three in particular, um, declined a lot of Red Bull parts to go on their car that they could have had this season, which of course looked initially to be a smart move, may not necessarily be the case after all. It's so hard to tell if the competition this season is going to create a development war between those teams to try and get third place because there's a lot of prize money on the line despite the budget cap. Um, But of course, the bigger picture of 2022 is ever so elusive. Ferrari, we know, have already said that they're going to continue to develop until around about the summer or just before and then stop. McLaren probably will do the same thing, I'd imagine. And it may force the other teams to do the same thing. So there is an opportunity there. But as you said, Courtney, because they're already falling behind quite dramatically to the leading teams in McLaren and Ferrari, that perhaps they may feel that they need to write this season off, do the best that they can and focus on 2022 to try and get a head start on everyone else. It's such a difficult decision. Um, But right now it looks like Alpha Tauri have either missed the boat or they're not extracting the most out of their car performance at this point in time again we'll have to wait and see another team that may also be looking to next season as their chance is Aston Martin and this is such a disappointment for them because at the start of the season before a wheel was turned everyone was saying third fastest they probably will be because they had the third fastest car last season the new rules have really hurt them to the point where Otmar Zafner has threatened legal action over these rule changes which I don't see much merit in because the rules were clearly made out to them they could have made changes and they actually agreed to them so I don't know where the discrepancy is on this part but I'll let Otmar do Otmar and uh, just you know report it as I see it but um, this weekend they brought some upgrades to Lance Stroll's car these were meant to be upgrades that they had ready for Spain but they were able to fast track them so brilliant job to the guys and gals over at Brackley and Aston Martin's facility to get this done but unfortunately it was only for one car which they gave to Lance Stroll. Now, the rationale behind this, despite people thinking Vettel is the number one driver, is because Stroll was leading the championship between the two cars. So naturally, they wanted to give him the benefit of that, which is fine. I think that's a fair way to run it. Um, Whether that is reciprocated, if Vettel does score more points than Lance at some point, we'll have to wait and see. But today... um, You know, it was a very difficult day for Aston Martin. Um, Vettel did a great job to qualify in the top 10. We saw the Sebastian Vettel of old and um, we did see hallmarks of it in this race as well for him to get 13th. But ultimately the two of them ended up fighting each other at the end of the race. And I think given that Stroll had a faster car underneath them, that's probably about right. But he ended up finishing behind Sebastian Vettel. And I guess my question, Courtney, is how must Aston Martin be feeling right now? Because not only are they nowhere near fighting well not only are they not fighting for a top three with McLaren and Ferrari and Alpine even but they're nowhere near it Mm. not even close to the point where even Giovinazzi and the Alfa Romeo beat them today so very very difficult what must the mood be like in Aston Martin right now I think you're right they've definitely suffered the most uh, from these regulation changes 
But what I must say, I stated in the last race review that Sebastian Vettel needs a quiet race. And he certainly got that today. He had a clean race. And I reckon that should be encouraging for them going forward. I think in terms of car performance, I don't really know where they're going to go from here. But in terms of the hopeful recovery for Sebastian Vettel, I really do believe this could be the start of it. And if anybody can get the best out of the package they have, it's Seb. So he could well be their main weapon going through the rest of the season. Mm, absolutely. And of course, the upgrades that they put on their car today, if Stroll had got a qualifying similar to what Seb did, who, Seb did, who, driv- who drove the older spec version, if you like, mm. they probably could have got in amongst the points today, but uh, it wasn't to be. Lance had places to make up. And in the end, despite overtaking Seb before the end of the race, Seb got him back. So, you know, uh, yes, the positive in this is that it looks like Seb had his best performance this season. As I said, I think Seb's performed relatively well in the last race and this one, but circumstances have prevented him from being able to get points. And today, the car just wasn't quick enough on a track that you probably feel that he should have been better. So mm. it's worrying times for Aston Martin. And as, as you said already, Courtney, they may prove to be one of the other teams that may decide to pull the trigger and go and develop their car for next year earlier than everyone else. They may have to at this point, whether they like it or not. Um, last couple of teams to talk about. We'll talk about Williams briefly before we get into Haas. Um, very difficult day. George Russell, brilliant on Saturday. Mr. Saturday, living up to his reputation. Half a tenth off Carlos Sainz's time in Q2. 11th on the grid. Best qualifying for George Russell. So close to Q3. And it would have been amazing if he'd have done it. But the car proving once again to be such a handful during the race. And I expected this to happen for Williams. I don't want to sound like a know-it-all or say, oh, I told you so, but this car has a very peaky downforce philosophy. Mm -hmm. And at certain circuits where it's going to be very windy, we know with the Algarve on the coast, it's incredibly windy. And the track undulating and ovulating and everything else as it does, it was never going to be a track that Williams were going to do well at. Unfortunately for them, that proved to be the case. And they really struggled today to the point where not only did they finish 16th in Russell, but in Latifi, they finished behind a Huss on merit today. So the atmosphere at Williams has got to be very, very bleak after a performance like today. Do, do you feel that this philosophy is going to work for Williams this season? Or do you feel that they probably should have just reverted to type and go with what everyone else was doing? Um, well, you beat me to it about the peak performance because you're right, this was certainly an example of it. Um, looking on as a neutral fan, it's time for George Russell to lead that team. It really is time. They're not, they're not going to be making massive enough strides for what a driver of George's calibre desires. It's, to, it's time for him to lead. Whether it be ideally with Mercedes, which looks like the only destination for him, it seems that George Russell's in a bit of a hole at the moment because if that Mercedes seat doesn't come available next season, he's gonna he's gonna be stuck in a team where he really can't showcase his talent on a Sunday, and and it's a real shame. You know, we we saw glimpses of it. You know, with his sole Mercedes um, performance in a uh, bar rank. That's right, bar rank last season. Yeah, it's it's time for him. It's just, it's time for him to get a bigger move because as an F one fan, the guy's wasted at the moment. Yeah, absolutely right. Um, I mean, of course, what George needs to do is just get his head down and just keep banging out those performances. I mean, people will take notice of the Saturday qualifying, of course, Sunday. I'm hoping that George can get a point this season, the Williams. He's had one or two. He's had an opportunity in Imola that kind of went by with that big crash with Bottas. Incidentally, Corny, we should mention this because this was mentioned by Ted Kravitz on the Sky coverage, but apparently... The damage caused by that incident, which George Russell definitely was to blame, cost Mercedes and Williams combined over £2 million. That is a hefty amount of money. To put that into perspective, guys, that alone is more than 1% of the total budgets for the teams this season. So I don't think that George Russell would have been very, very popular going into either Mercedes or Williams on the Monday after that crash when they itemised that repair bill. So, yeah, as I said, less of those weekends for George, more of the Saturday performances and, of course, 
better performances hopefully on the Sunday. As I said, he's probably doing as good as he can. And I don't think there's a doubt in my mind that he is. But unfortunately, the car, it will have better weekends. I think it's fair to say this will probably be the, the most difficult weekend for Williams this season in terms of track conditions versus what the car is capable of. But um, oh, it's going to be such a tall order for George Russell. Hopefully he can do something. I'm going to make a call. I think I know where he's going to get his first point. Ooh. Monaco. Uh, that's a good... Maybe, maybe. It's not a bad idea. I'm, we'll just have I'll to see... Monaco. We'll have to see how the chassis holds up and the mechanical grip yeah. of that car because it hasn't really been tested yet, but it did no. look good at Imola. So I think that's something, some solace you can take from that, that it might be good elsewhere. So fingers crossed for George. Hopefully he can do well. Um, again, Latifi also had a... He struggled today as well yeah. as we expected. But let's get into Huss now. Um, let's start with Mazepin um, because obviously Mazepin completed another race, you know, so way, you know, but um, yeah, you know, you, you got to lay praise where you can, but Mazepin making a uh, bit of a mistake um, over, how do I, would I call it? The protocol in letting lap, well, cars through to lap you where he almost drove into Sergio Perez in turn two whether he knew Perez was there or he just didn't want to let him through, I don't know. But he ended up getting a five-second penalty. And I think he got some penalty points on his super license for dangerous driving as a result. Perez not impressed by that. And uh, neither were we, to be fair. Well, it's not the first time it's happened. Um, I just, I really don't get the deal with this guy. You know, like we, we, all, we all know the background to it. But... I don't know. It, it seems like he's almost enjoying that kind of like bad boy image just come with him. Like, I'm not saying he's deliberately smashing into people, but I don't know. It seems like he almost gets off on it because it, it's like a one off mistake. But he's, it just seems that Mazepin can't go a weekend without getting negative headlines. He's almost like he's almost like the Jake Paul of Formula One. Oh, um, I mean. For those of you lucky enough not to know who Jake Paul is, um, that's not a compliment from Courtney there. So, but having said that, you know, I I mean, I'm not going to go there on this one because we've been around this before and, Mm. you know, but with Mazepin, I think for me, I'm as, as a driver, I feel like, you know, you need the F2 driver to step up into Formula One and Mazepin hasn't really done that yet. Um, He's still... There's still certain hallmarks to the way he drives that isn't fitting of F1 for good reason. And, you know, he he needs to work on that. He's going to get time, though. That's one thing he does have. He's going to get time to work on this, to improve where he needs to, hopefully to a point where he can be a competitive F1 driver that operates in the right manner. We'll have to wait and see. But at the moment, he's not only... Um, creating headlines for his driving, not necessarily being in the right spirit or perhaps a bit dangerous or a bit naive, if you like, but he's equally not that quick. And that's something that even though the car is not going to be very good, he's going to have to work on that as well because that car is not going to get any quicker. It's not going to get any easier for him either. Um, But we'll move on. We'll round this up with Mick Schumacher. I don't think many people are going to be celebrating a smile on your face. It, there is. That's why your phone is still doing well. <laughs> I mean, it's Mick Schumacher's seventeenth is not the best performance he's put in this season. He obviously finished. I think it was sixteenth in Bahrain. Um, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think Bahrain he did finish higher than this one. But it was very, very satisfying for me personally as well. Big Schumacher fan. Obviously, I want Mick to do very, very well. Um, and I've followed Mick Schumacher's career for a very, very long time, and. There's certain hallmarks, even before the race today, that we saw in qualifying, where Mick very nearly got out of Q1, actually. So that was impressive in its own right. But um, to finish today relatively strong and make an overtake on merit in a car that shouldn't really be racing anybody other than his teammate, I'm not going to lie, Courtney, that was a very satisfying moment as a fan to watch and really, really happy for him. The team were really happy. They were, you know, they were saying on the radio to him, it's like, yes, come on, Mick, you know, you've got him. Brilliant. And you're like, it's a very small victory in the grand scheme of things. But for Haas and for the development of their drivers, particularly Mick Schumacher, I think everybody is really watching with a magnifying glass where they can. We're already starting to see 
one of the strongest attributes in Mick Schumacher's arsenal. Not the fact that he's humble and that he's an incredibly nice guy. From what I hear, one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet. And I will say this on record, Michael, his father, you know, keep fighting, Michael, and hopefully we'll see you again one day in F1. But Michael was certainly not what you would call the nicest guy in the paddock. There was a ruthlessness and a grit about mm. him. Um, he wasn't horrible, but he he wasn't the sort of person that would um, go out of their way with the niceties and everything else in the same way that his son Nick is. And do you know what? That really warms the heart of uh, me in particular as, an, as a huge Schumacher fan um, in the past and obviously today. But there's certain attributes to his driving where he's really developing. He's really working hard. He's literally looking at every single facet of data he can to improve himself. And we're already seeing improvements in his driving. We're, you know, he's made mistakes. He's going to make mistakes like he did at Imola, but he recovered and he did relatively well. And today he didn't really make a mistake this weekend. Pretty faultless. Um, I mean, he had a bit of a spin in practice, but other than that, mm. He's getting better. And that is something Huss will love to see. And Ferrari will love to see as well. And hopefully, if he continues to improve at the rate he did in these F2 days, where he was untouchable at times, this could be a guy who may not achieve what his father did in Formula One. And that's like an incredibly high bar. But I tell you what, he could still go a very, very long way on merit and not just because of the fact his name is Schumacher. Well, in, in a weird way, I think, starting at the very bottom could be a blessing for him because when you've got a when you've got a car that doesn't perform well in in a weird way it makes you become a better driver because you've got to extract the very best out of yourself to get anything from that car and for a has to overtake a car on merit that is a big deal like maybe some people look and go oh they're making a big fuss out of nothing it's not like they won any points but if you accept the level that your car is at and you see a driver excel then of course you're going to be proud and this could be a very good experience for Mick. Absolutely. And hopefully that continues to improve. Gunther Steiner was singing his praises about Mick over the course of the weekend. I'm sure he would have been delighted about Mick's performance today, as some of the rest of us were. But of course, that pretty much sums up our race review for the Portuguese Grand Prix. Lewis Hamilton getting the big result today, getting the win over Max Verstappen to make it two wins to one as we go into Barcelona. Of course, we will do our race preview for the Spanish Grand Prix in Friday's DNF1 podcast this week because it's a double race week um, as we go into that one. Just want to be a bit real for a moment with you guys on something that Courtney and I have been uh, taking to heart quite literally, I think, for the last couple of months. And this isn't one of those where we were hoping to ever have to do. We were hoping that we would try and be YouTubers that don't complain about the algorithm or stuff like this. But it seems that for whatever reason, smaller channels like ours and some other channels as well in the F1 genre or demographic, if you like, are struggling because the algorithms have changed to such a degree where they're not promoting content like ours or even other content in particular. Um, we're not going to go into what they're focusing on, obviously, because it don't want to sound like moaning. But and this isn't just affecting us. This is affecting other channels as well. So if you do watch our stuff and you do enjoy it, please, please, please like the video and consider subscribing as well. It's absolutely free. I won't go into as much as what Courtney would do on this one, putting a picture of Ty from Arsenal Fan TV saying you're a disgrace <laughs> because that's not how we truly feel. But I love I love the enthusiasm on that one, Courtney, um, on the Instagram oh. page. But yes, please do support us where you can and share our videos as well. If you know anyone that would like our videos or podcasts, please do share with them because we love making them. And there's a lot of you guys that do tune in, really love enjoying them. So we're pretty sure that there is a plethora of viewers that would be interested in our content that probably don't get to see it because YouTube don't promote it. And one video in particular that I would like to promote on this channel, um, and we don't normally do this for others. We, you know, we're very much independent in this, but a friend of ours, Samit from Vulcan Motorsport, his YouTube channel, definitely check that out. He recently posted a video a couple of days ago on his channel, a documentary about Michael Schumacher called The Schumacher Instinct. And it's a half an hour documentary, but I'll tell you what, guys, it's one of the best videos that I have seen on YouTube. F1 related, it's one of the best videos I see. It's so well made. It's better than anything I've ever made on this in terms of the videos that I, other videos that I make. 
Um, and that's not to knock me. This video is incredibly good in quality. Samit himself does an incredible voiceover. He's worked his ass off for the last couple mm. of months to make this video. And I watched it. Courtney's watched it. We agree. It's fantastic. But YouTube, the algorithm doesn't seem to agree for whatever reason. And it's nothing to do with quality because this is an incredibly good video. So please, if you have half an hour spare or if you're traveling or whatever, or if you love your F1 and love the story of Michael Schumacher, please, please, please go to Vulcan Motorsports channel. Check that video out. We will put a link to his video in the description and in the comments, tell him that the lads at DNF1 sent you. You know, you will not regret it. Honestly, you will not regret it. He's a good friend yeah, of ours and he would absolutely, we would appreciate if you could check that out if you have a spare half an hour. Yeah, I'll just like to briefly say, I've, I've said it to you and, I, and I've said it to him after watching the video. I, I, I saw the views that he got in his video and it's simply criminal for two reasons. First of all, for the quality itself, it deserves a lot more. And the amount of work, I, I, it's very easy. When you just go on YouTube and you watch videos, I think it's very easy to forget how much time and effort it takes to make videos, particularly videos of that quality. Like, I know that when you've done, like, this videos or even, like, the shorts videos, because we saw the shorts videos didn't do well on the algorithm. Mm. But these videos take hours. They take hours of our time, or Adam's time in this sense. And it's... It's, it's really deflating for these people, you know, particularly for someone like him who's putting in, you could, you could tell that that's his passion and he's not getting the, the, the feedback for it. So please, please, please support his channel because his stuff really is great and it's not getting the, the attention it deserves. Absolutely. And it's the same for a lot of smaller channels, um, not just ours, of course, you know, we can self-promote all that we want. It's our channel. This is what mm. we do. Um, I'm happily going to be a shameless self-promoter. I'm hoping one day that will pay off big time. But having worked on videos myself and done stuff like this, which is a new skill for me. It's something I've had to teach myself and plenty of other YouTubers have done the same thing. It does require a lot of time, days, weeks, sometimes months. I've made a couple of shorts videos and it takes a couple of days, but you're working flat wow. out, not just eight hours. You're working like 10, 12 hours just to put out a video like three or four minutes long. So for something of that quality that I know took to me a good couple of months to make, and it's incredibly good, I really, really want him to do well on his channel. I want us to do well. Please, if you can, guys, check out his channel. What Check out his stuff. Of course, check out our stuff as well. You know, there's, there's so many videos on this channel that people actually watch like months after they've been made, only because it's been recommended to them. Like I see comments on Lewis Hamilton, the, the knighthood video. We did that back in November last year. Yeah. And that was our second video to get a thousand views because it was a big topic. And I said to Samit and Jess, like, unless it's Lewis Hamilton in the title, it's hard to get views. And in a way, that's true. Not for a bad yeah. thing. But as I said, we could go on about this for ages. We've got really got to wrap this podcast up because this is long <laughs> enough as it is. But please, yeah, definitely check him out. I'll put a link in the description. You will not regret it. And tell him that Adam and Courtney from DNF1 sent you in the comments. OK, show him some love <laughs> as well. Uh, anyway, guys, that is the end of the DNF1 F1 podcast. We'll be back with another podcast on Friday where we'll be previewing the Spanish Grand Prix. And of course, we absolutely cannot wait. But until then, take care. Thanks for tuning in and we will see you in the next episode of the DNF1 F1 podcast. Take care. See you soon.